Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. The program tonight is a part of the Cancer Wellness Center's Men's Health Education and Support Series, funded in part by a grant from Estella's. This evening, we'll be talking about men's mental health, wellness, self-image, and confidence. For those of you new to the center, we're a nonprofit organization aimed to improve the physical and emotional well-being of those impacted by cancer and their families. We provide a variety of free programs and services, some which include education programs like the one this evening, support services, and wellness classes. For more information, please visit cancerwellness.org. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome our two presenters this evening, Kim Matthews and Dom James. My name is Kim Matthews. I am the support programs coordinator at the Cancer Wellness Center, which means I coordinate our support groups, but have lots of facilitative facilitators of our groups, including Dom, who facilitates our men's group and our young adult group. And I also see individuals, couples, and families in our counseling program and teach some classes. Thanks for joining us tonight. All right, thank you. Um, I am Dominique. I, as Kim mentioned, uh, lead the men's survivor group as well as the young adults group. Um, I'm also doing individual counseling couples counseling, you name it. Uh, I also do a uh, class on creative writing called uh, the CWC Writing Lab. So if you ever wanna get into some writing, uh, feel free to call the center. Uh, we'll be doing enrollment at some time in the near future and uh, some other little fun things here and there at the center. So uh, yeah, I will go ahead and get us started uh, with the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint and confidence with your hosts, Kim Matthew and Dom James. So let's go ahead and get started. So for starters, um, we are very fortunate to be able to do this. Um, we also feel like it's time to give back to the men within the cancer community and just want to provide as much information and knowledge on how to be the best men we can be um, through this journey. And so we chose to do this because we found that 60% of men experience mental distress during their diagnosis and treatment. So it's a good amount, uh, well over half. And uh, we just want to make sure that the right uh, sources for stress relief, uh, information, everything is going to be provided. So towards the end of this session, we're going to be sharing some of the other events that we'll be having um, throughout the summer and then throughout the course of the year. Um, so why are we just focusing on men in particular? So guys generally aren't as likely to go out and seek mental health treatment, whether that's counseling, support groups, or so on. Um, what this has to do with might be the social norms uh, that pertain to masculinity. So these are things like uh, trying to look strong, trying to look tough, all the sort of social norms around uh, seeking help that don't necessarily tie into the image of looking masculine. And so we want to make sure that those who do want to sort of reach out for those services uh, certainly have the avenues uh, available for them uh, when it's time. And so uh, oftentimes uh, folks will end up downplaying their symptoms, whether that's pain, whether that's um, emotional stress, uh, whatever that may be, um, there's sort of an air of toughness that may come about with being a male. And so we just want to make sure that when that's the case, um, we're going to be uh, ensuring that there's some sort of treatment regimens. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're open to sort of say, like, if we are feeling a pain so that we can make sure that um, if cancer is something that's there, uh, we're getting that checked out by our physicians whether that's an irregular pain, whether that's something that's new, uh, a lump or anything like that, we wanna make sure we're open about that channel of communication. Um, and then additionally, there seems to be a certain levels of disconnect and isolation. So often men will sort of take things on their own as opposed to reaching out to others to sort of tell them whether they've been having a challenge, whether that has to do with uh, situations at work, uh, health, maybe an injury, any of these sorts of things. Sometimes we, uh, as men, keep these to ourselves, which is something we should try, try to start uh, shying away from. But inevitably, uh, there certainly is a culture around that that we want to acknowledge. And so um, in doing this series, we, we definitely want to make people aware of that, whether that's our partners or ourselves um, as we sort of move through. And so um, in discussing this and in sort of examining 
what's causing uh, the mental health issues in, in these cases. This can be the upheaval caused by diagnosis. So this is any sort of mental strain or pain that's coming on when you find out the news or as you're sort of enduring um, the cancer journey, uh, the process, all of the treatments. So of course, this can cause anxiety, depression, um, all, any array of mental health maladies. Um, also, of course, that ties into anxiety related to the treatment decisions. So often um, when you are going through your treatment plan, you don't have as much control as uh, you may have had or autonomy as you may have had uh, prior to the cancer experience. And so you're really sort of just trusting and having faith in your treatment team as you go along. Also sort of trusting and relying on um, family members or friends a little bit more than uh, you may have in the past. And so that may be new to you, which of course can cause some level of distress, um, as well as the uh, treatments and the medication. We do know that these can cause different cognitive side effects, um, physical side effects, whether those are sexual, um, whether your memory is sort of not as available as it once was, all of these sort of things may have a quick onset during the chemo treatments or any of the treatments uh, given the medication uh, that you may be using or taking. Um, and then also the uncertainty that sort of goes along with uh, the treatment process. Often the uh, prognosis isn't entirely clear. And so of course this can cause distress as we sort of barrel into the unknown. And so um, as you're sort of experiencing that and we have some uh, tips to sort of discuss on how we can deal with uncertainty, but we certainly want to acknowledge why this can cause distress, particularly to men. Um, and so, yeah, uh, all right. Yep, yeah, all good stuff. I think um, to tack on to what Dom is saying, the three aspects that we primarily are going to focus on tonight in regards to how men's lives are impacted by the cancer diagnosis are that sense of masculinity, self-image and body image and confidence and self-esteem, how those are impacted. And then, as you said, we'll talk about ways to cope with those or get support around that. Okay, on to the next slide. So masculinity, what is it? What does it mean to be a man? Um, really, I think it's sort of a, tr a trick question. Um, there's no true definition, um, whether that's how you identify physically or not. Um, masculinity is sort of this crystallized concept, uh, though you know there is some level of fluidity for all of us. Um, particularly those of us who do identify as men um, tend to want to have certain traits. Um, and so those traits sort of include independence and self-reliance, sort of being able to uh, interact with any environments on your own, being able to sort of have control and take control as necessary, um, virility. So this is basically um, just really the essence of what masculinity is. This is sort of strength. This is sort of uh, resilience, all of these sort of things that are tied into that definition. Um, physical strength, of course, which uh, we know is impeded um, with the cancer diagnosis. Uh, as you go through treatment, of course, muscle mass uh, may deplete. And so that's always going to be a challenge. Um, and then adaptability, um, being able to sort of be flexible and fluid through any given situation and be able to figure it out quickly. Um, and then, of course, gaining the respect of peers and family members. And so we're able to sort of see how all of these aspects can be affected by a cancer diagnosis, um, whether they improve or are depleted. Um, we certainly want to pay attention to how those are affected uh, through that journey. And so um, to go a little bit further, um, we also want to make sure to examine the fact that we're all sort of socialized to uh, live and lead a certain example. Um, this is always going to be taught to us initially by our families. And then of course, society is going to tell us exactly what it is to be a man. And so you may see that through movies. I remember growing up watching James Bond and thinking, okay, this is what a guy is supposed to do, drinking martinis, smoking cigarettes and shooting his gun at anyone who sort of gets in his way. Um, but we kind of know and recognize now that that's not necessarily the only way to uh, deal with issues or challenges that may come before our path. And then there's also a certain level of uh, self-expectation um, that men may have for themselves. As we navigate um, through life, we certainly want to lead a certain example. We certainly want to look confident. We want to appear a certain way. We're constantly going to 
compare ourselves to others in doing so and want to be able to provide for those around us. Um, so there's so many gender roles that uh, we may or may not believe we have to sort of work with and fall into. Um, but a lot of this is, you know, not necessary. Um, you know, some of it can be really helpful as we look for strength, as we look for ways to navigate and ways to be confident. We always do want to be confident, but we don't necessarily have to fulfill the role in every capacity as it's been laid out um, by the media or by some other folks around us. So the next slide before I jump onto it is about some research that was done and it just was published in 2021. The researchers looked at, I think, 68 different qualitative studies. So studies where men were interviewed or they were part of a focus group. And these, in that study, they were all men who had prostate cancer, but so, of, so much of what they found about men in that study can be translated to uh, just about any cancer diagnosis that a man faces. Um, yep, put there. And uh, in those studies, a total of almost 1500 men were uh, questioned about their cancer diagnosis and about how they define masculinity, self-esteem, body image when they're diagnosed and as they become what the researchers identified as a cancer survivor. So becoming a cancer patient, as you see in the middle here in that large gray box, is the immediate, immediate changes that men experience, the impact on their masculinity, their self-esteem, their body image. And these again are things that men identified. Um, then the other box, becoming a prostate cancer survivor, or in this case, in our case, a cancer survivor, describes the ways that men eventually accommodate and accept their new realities by reframing some of these definitions of masculinity. So for instance, um, a threat to masculinity might be the um, sense of shame that they experience just from being diagnosed or because maybe they don't have the strength or the ability to do everything that they were used to doing. Maybe they can't work anymore and maybe that was a primary focus of their life and expectation in their family. So there might be shame around that or threats to their masculinity around that. The lighter green box, or the, I'm sorry, the orange box is about changes to bodily function. So discomfort, pain, um, feeling like their body has betrayed them, feeling like their body is broken. Changes to bodily treatment are in relation to the medical field. So somebody else handling your body, somebody else doing things to your body. And that can be a sense of vulnerability, a sense that your body is not your own. So those are struggles often early in the cancer diagnosis and in cancer treatment. Um, as men become survivors, whether that's when they're still in treatment, whether that's post-treatment, the men who talk about finding ways to redefine, reaffirm, reassert their masculinity, tend to report better quality of life, less distress, less depression, less anxiety. Um, and some of the things that we, you'll see in the boxes here, like regaining confidence, becoming a mentor, we'll discuss a little bit later. We'll discuss more about what it means to reaffirm your masculinity or use humor. One thing you see there is trade-offs. So the example that they used in this particular research is that sometimes when men have a diagnosis and they're deciding on treatment, they might have to or define trade-offs that they make. So maybe it's a trade-off in sexual function and decisions about, well, is that a worthwhile trade-off for my health, for my life? Maybe, maybe not. You know, these are decisions that that people make. Um, so trade-offs are part of reasserting, redefining who they are as a person. Um, anything else you want to comment on here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and you know, I don't know if you're able to see this, but uh, on there it sort of speaks to uh, with these threats to masculinity, uh, comparison to women or uh, inability to be a man, loss of sexuality and being infallible, all of these sort of things that are sort of crystallized within the identity of what masculinity is. And, um, you know, the sooner we're able to sort of break down these ideas and sort of say that 
you know, these aren't necessarily the only components to what masculinity is or what it is to be a man. Um, the sooner we're able to sort of cope with and deal with uh, the fact that masculinity isn't necessarily something um, one can lose, whether you're a man or not, you basically who you are as and who you identify as. And so in being able to do so, we always want to sort of create the narrative that works best for us and one that's always going to sort of put us in a positive light. That way we're able to survive a little bit better. That way we're able to transition towards survivorship a little more smoothly and without necessarily feeling quite as fallible um, and being able to reinstill some of that confidence. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. One more thing, I'm gonna add that renegotiating relationships piece. So that is, it says there the role of partners, limitations of healthcare. So it's really about renegotiating relationships with your healthcare team with partners, with family members, coworkers, friends, sometimes that's allowing some vulnerability. Dom mentioned before that um, some men have a hard time even seeking healthcare, being honest with their doctor about how they're doing. I know when I work with couples, sometimes wives are frustrated if their husband wants to present as a good patient and not talk about or not complain uh, about how they're feeling. And so that challenge of, is it complaining or is it, am I advocating for myself? Am I letting my doctor know what I'm experiencing so that I can get the best, best healthcare? Am I talking with my spouse, with my partner, with my family members about the kind of support that I need? So how um, open are you to communication and how are those, negoti those relationships negotiated and renegotiated based on the cancer diagnosis. So men who report some ability to renegotiate that also report less distress, better quality of life. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about self-image. Um, and so one of the first things I think anyone does when they either lose their hair or they're starting to see that um, their muscles are sort of losing their form or any of these things is of course examine who am I? How do I look? How do I look when I go out? How do people sort of perceive me, right? And so what we wanna do in those cases as we sort of assess our self image um, is try and steer away from so many of those negatives and move towards holding yourself in kind of high self esteem. And so uh, basically this idea of positive self regard and basically being able to say, okay, I'm looking, I'm standing up tall, I am confident, I am, sort of engaging in some positive self-talk um, so that I don't necessarily feel quite as burdened by uh, you know, some of the challenges that I am dealing with currently. We're not necessarily avoiding those. Uh, we're certainly recognizing them, but we do want to find balance as we are uh, examining ourselves. We always want to sort of weigh these negatives or these challenges with something positive as we're going along. An example of that might be, um, I was able to have a little bit more energy today. How am I going to use this energy? I'm feeling better, or maybe I'm not feeling great today, but um, I'm glad that you know I'm being cared for. I'm glad that I have a support network, sort of uh, just making sure that there's some positivity within the uh, dialogue you're kind of having with yourself. Um, and so in doing so, that way we're kind of setting up good expectations um, as we're looking at what we've been presented with. So as we look at expectations versus reality and sort of saying, okay, I know where I am currently. I don't have maybe quite as much strength or maybe I'm having issues with um, having sex with my partner. Uh, what steps do I need to take? You know, we're not going to just dismiss any sort of um, challenge that we're, we're faced with. We're going to sort of try to address those immediately and realistically so that we're able to um, deal with them appropriately um, instead of sort of holding ourselves to the expectation of what we had prior to the diagnosis. We're sort of adjusting and uh, trying to be kind to ourselves throughout the process. So um, something else I'd like to talk to you about, um, maybe you've heard of uh, just how important our mindset is um, within any endeavor. And so the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, um, basically it's something we even teach to our children, right? This idea that if I'm constantly learning, I'm constantly uh, molding and 
mutable, then I'm able to sort of address new issues or challenges with an open mind. That way I'm not going to shut down whenever something new happens. If I'm having uh, incontinence, I'm not gonna see this as something that I am going to have permanently. This isn't necessarily the rest of my life. This is something I am dealing with now. This is a challenge I will get through, right? And so just being able to have that sort of mindset is gonna be so helpful as opposed to the fixed mindset where I'm sort of closing off doors, not necessarily being as malleable or adaptive. And as I've mentioned earlier, we always want to try and adapt um, in moving through the cancer diagnosis, just so that we have a positive mindset and so that we're able to sort of move forward. And, and here I have uh, the word yet. And so the power of the word yet, as we're sort of looking at things um, through a lens of time really is just sort of saying, I might not be able to do this now, or I might not be able to do this yet, but eventually I will be working my way up towards something. And so we're always sort of trying to look at things gradually, um, looking at progress, maybe um, just trying to sort of be patient with ourselves. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then finally, um, with regards to performance anxiety, you know, we're always going to have challenges. We've had challenges our entire lives. And whether or not we're being productive about the anxiety we possess or not, we always sort of want to look at anxiety um, through a model of diminishing marginal returns. So that, of course, is your nice little slope, um, a nice upside down U. And so when we have that productive anxiety, we're sort of looking at, okay, I'm starting to feel maybe a little bit more tense as I'm preparing to do something. Maybe that's a scan that's coming up. Maybe that's um, anything really. Um, and so as we get to a certain point, that anxiety is no longer going to be helping us as we sort of start to spiral, we might start to panic, these sort of things. We wanna be able to recognize when this is happening. We wanna make sure that if we are beginning to spiral as that anxiety turns negative and uh, maladaptive, that we're seeking the help that's necessary. And that's when we really wanna start implementing some of these actions as far as uh, positive self-regard goes, really sort of setting our expectations differently and making sure that we are uh, doing well with treating ourselves, speaking to people, um, getting the support that we need. Right. I think um, in addition on the expectations versus reality and the anxiety, just the way that they often fit together is that we have often very high expectations of ourselves. And I think of the example of fatigue, Fatigue is the biggest side effect of a cancer diagnosis. It's the biggest side effect of cancer itself, of surgery, and of every treatment. So that is a pretty universal. And one thing that the men I work with often struggle with is how much energy to expend. You know, there's something that they want to do. They don't have maybe enough energy. Um, how do they kind of look at their energy bank? How do they know how much they can do on any given day. What if it's something they really want to do and they're going to be exhausted? Is that okay if the next day they are in bed or on the couch all day? So it's a big shift. Um, and I think, again, one of those challenges to masculinity, that strength, that being able to do what you want to do, uh, it feels like a big loss. It is a loss. And so I'm just using that example, but in so many uh, different examples, when you're dealing with a cancer diagnosis, it's about having to reset those expectations. This is my reality now. How am I going to work with that? So with the fatigue, with the energy, what's my energy bank? How much can I do on a given day? How much do I need to rest? How much do I push myself? How much am I honest with my uh, family members, the people who live with me about what I need from them, what support so that I don't use my energy on things that I can get some help with, but I can be as independent as possible. So it's a lot of there's so many different interconnected pieces. And um, when Dom was talking about anxiety, that came to mind too. It can cause a lot of anxiety when we're trying to figure out what is this fatigue? What is this pain? Um, whatever symptom you're experiencing, is it related to the treatment? Is it related to the cancer? So always, I think, having to work at being a little bit more comfortable being open, asking questions of your doctors, nurse maybe, um, just to pay attention to figuring out the new you 
what your body is able to do and what the challenges are while you're going through cancer treatment. I think that's all part of the self image and the body image. Absolutely. And uh, we certainly always want to remember that when we're not living up to those expectations, um, that's when most of the time this anxiety is going to start to show up. And uh, once we're able to sort of balance that out and uh, find ways to perceive ourselves in the world um, a little bit differently or a little bit more apt to um, what's necessary, then we can start to ease some of that stress. So make sure you're trying to be mindful about that at all times. Okay. So self-image continued and body image. So really these are several of the uh, categories where um, a lot of change is going to be happening. Um, and these can also cause much of that stress. Um, I'm sure many of you uh, are either familiar with these or have certainly uh, spoken about it or experienced it. Um, whether those are changes to your physical appearance, the experience of fatigue, as Kim just mentioned, um, experiencing more pain, um, surgical body modifications, this may be uh, just scars or any sort of uh, leftovers from uh, procedures that you may have had, surgeries, um, cognitive impairment, of course, maybe brain fog, uh, lapses in memory, issues with being tired, and then, of course, um, sexual functioning, um, which I'll get into in just a moment. Uh, I don't know if you want to... Nope, I think range. those are all pretty self-explanatory. If people have any other comments or questions yeah, at the end, certainly we can, we can hop into that. Um, and so... In, in addressing sexual functioning in particular, I think that uh, with so many of these, uh, we'll certainly be talking about physical appearance in a bit and uh, really just how you sort of view yourself, how you're sort of seeing and experiencing these changes within your body, um, which can be, of course, like disconcerting. You've lived with a certain appearance your entire life. Now, all of a sudden that's gone, whether that's a change in your hair, body weight, anything that's, a, that's sort of happening, imbalance has been created. And so dealing with that, and then on top of that, not necessarily having the energy or the ability to go and work out, lift weights, or go for a run if you put on weight, any of these sort of things, that much more of the control has been lost. And you know, referring back to that definition of masculinity, it can be that much more of a challenge for men as they realize that maybe they do need a little bit more assistance or help, or to just sort of be patient as they go through um, their treatments and knowing that you're going to eventually be able to either have some form of exercise, whether that's through physical therapy, being able to sort of retrain those muscles, um, not necessarily being able to get back to full capacity, but still being able to make some level of progress um, as you're sort of moving forward. And so um, as far as the sexual functioning piece, um, oftentimes um, with any sort of cancer, um, after the, uh, the treatment, after chemo, this is going to cause generally a decline in sexual abilities. It's not guaranteed, but it's often something that's experienced, whether that's issues with um, erectile dysfunction or low libido. Um, and of course, this ties right back into masculinity. As, as men, you know, you want to be able to please your partner, so on and so forth. And uh, not no longer having the capacity, ability, or maybe even the interest in doing so doesn't mean that you're not able to do it. In all honesty, there's sometimes different methods. Um, I know one thing we've spoken about in my uh, men's group is the effectiveness of Cialis. Sometimes you just need to uh, speak with your physician, your primary care doctor, and ask them, what are your options? You know, And then also, how do we sort of re-examine intimacy? Um, does that mean that no longer are we looking to penetrative sex as the only means of enjoying pleasure or, or pleasing our partners. Sometimes we may have to find alternate means, whether that means more cuddling, maybe that means more of a uh, more touching, different ways of building up towards arousal um, than the uh, normal sort of sexual script that we may follow. And uh, just to define the sexual script, often we have specific actions, um, whether that's, you know, uh, hugging our partner more, or maybe we like to have a glass of wine before dinner, or maybe, you know, there, there are just so many sort of actions that we may start to initiate to sort of indicate, indicate to our partners, uh, either verbally or non-verbally, that we are interested in pursuing 
um, sex. And so in doing so, this may be something that needs to be altered or maybe even examined so that you and your partner are sort of aware of what are those patterns, you know, um, are you, you might even know it right now, you might be aware of it or thinking about it to yourself. And uh, in doing so, maybe that's something you need to openly discuss um, so that you can kind of say, all right, we sort of know what the progression is, we sort of know where this is going, and we can sort of be that much more intentional um, in pursuing that. Um, so, yeah. I think so often when I work with couples, that sexual script is really important because what happens if if that sexual script for instance is a back massage or hugging or a kiss sometimes that stops altogether for concern of it being an expectation that it will go further and so then there's more distance between the couple and so that communication as Dom was saying is really important for couples and that goes back to the renegotiating relationships um, how do you still maintain an intimate relationship how do you define intimacy as far as the actual sexuality, the sexual functioning, there will be a Cancer Wellness Center program. We've got the date at the end in our slides, I think it's in July. Mm -hmm. So if uh, that is of interest to you, stay tuned for that. Indeed. Okay. All right. Okay, confidence. So uh, if you wanna be like our guy here, uh, full-fledged and you know, shredding his stuff, um, you know, I think it's all about relativity, right? It's all about, uh, once again, sort of setting those realistic expectations and also sort of just saying, you know, what expectations are you going to try to live up to? What are you working towards? And also, who are you sort of comparing yourself to? Are you comparing yourself to your previous self? Are you comparing yourself to where you expected to be at this point? Um, just sort of trying to keep that all in perspective and sort of realizing that relativity is so key to how we perceive the world around us and just sort of saying, okay, I'm examining things under a specific lens. Um, this is what I want, but is this something that I can achieve in this particular moment? Is it something I'll eventually be able to work to? Also relative to um, my diagnosis, how am I doing? You know, being able to sort of look at everything through a relative lens is always going to be um, sort of helpful for just decreasing some of the stress that may go with setting our expectations too high for ourselves. And that's in any capacity, really, whether that has to do with the cancer or not. Um, and so much to do with even communication. How are we doing in terms of speaking with our family members? speaking to our doctor, how much, um, how aware are we of uh, what's going on and what we're capable of um, within those moments? I don't know if you want to. Um, yeah, so that locus of control piece, how much is, so our locus of control, is it is it internal or is it external? So that's something that you come into this diagnosis with, who you are. Are you somebody who believes that you have a sense of control over what happens in your life? Or are you somebody who believes that things just happen to you? And the reason that we have that in here is that's something that you certainly can examine. That's something that we can shift a little bit because people who tend to have an internal sense of control or internal locus of control, a belief that they have some control over their environment, over their surroundings, tend to cope a little bit better with a cancer diagnosis. Cancer itself feels very out of control. We often don't have answers about why we got the diagnosis being in treatment and the side effects and symptoms can feel very out of control. So finding ways to reassert some control in your life. And we'll, like, when we get to uh, reaffirming, redefining masculinity, we talk a little bit more about that. But I think that also plays into this sense of self-confidence and self-esteem. If you feel like you've got some control in your life and you haven't lost it all with the cancer diagnosis. Absolutely. And so much of that can be done by really having that level of communication with your treatment team, with uh, family members, sort of letting them know um, how you're doing, speaking to friends. And like often uh, times a lot of what I hear is in communicating with others or telling folks about, OK, this is kind of how I'm doing right now. Maybe uh, it's it's easier instead of feeling as though, you know, I'm going to have to answer this question. This is stressing me out. Someone's going to come and ask me, how am I doing? Right. And we all know this is sort of that annoying question. And 
when asked, there's no right answer. The person's generally not going to respond in a way that's uh, going to be satisfying to us. But maybe if we have something either prepared of um, whether that's uh, this is kind of what's going on, having sort of a script uh, sort of ready, um, sometimes that'll let us feel like we have a little bit more control in those social scenarios um, that of course can sort of lead into uh, our confidence within any sort of social engagement. Um, so we always sort of want to lean towards being prepared. Um, preparedness is, is always like feeds directly into uh, confidence as, uh, as sort of defined in the terms of, of masculinity. And so um, just try and uh, ensure that that's something that you're, you're, you're capable of, right? And so, um, and, and really just to sort of come back to uh, dealing with challenges, dealing with any sort of setbacks, uh, we always want to sort of look at those positively. We always sort of want to come out sort of saying, I did the best I could. If you didn't do the best you could, um, that's sort of something we want to maybe analyze for future uh, situations because it's not the end, you know, I mean, you're always constantly improving, right? And so as you're doing so, maybe examining, okay, where could I have done this better? Does that mean that Maybe my diet isn't as well as good as it could have been. Maybe I didn't go for as many walks as I could have. But if we're sort of looking at this with that growth mindset and sort of saying, okay, I might not have done it this time, but I can, as I move forward, we're able to be that much more confident about the future and what we're then capable of. Well, I think that relates to the acknowledging success because it can be really easy to get down on ourselves. The, I didn't walk as far as I wanted to, or I didn't eat what I wanted to, but acknowledging the successes, it's easier sometimes for us to look at where we feel like there are failures, but if we set some small, attainable, realistic goals, getting back to the fatigue or the energy, for instance, what research shows with that is that some mild to moderate activity is actually the best way to combat fatigue. And so it might be, you know, today I can walk to the end of my driveway and back. That might feel like a success because it's more than I did yesterday. Maybe within a week, I can walk to the end of the uh, end of the block and back. So they might seem like small goals, but they are attainable goals and ways to measure some success and feel some success rather than feeling failure. Yeah, and, and we always want to tie that back to relativity too, you know, just sort of looking at this is what I'm capable of. This is what I, I can handle at this point. I may be able to handle a bit more later, but right now I'm just doing what's best for me, right? And we're sort of trying to take all of these sort of external stressors and environments and events and putting them to the side a little bit and just looking um, at ourselves and sort of saying, what can I do and am I doing it? And, uh, and just sort of leaving it at that. We don't wanna overcomplicate things because then we're comparing to everyone else around us and we know that that's not gonna be uh, necessarily productive for us. And finally, growth takes time. We know that growth and development can always be kind of glacial um, at times. And we know that sometimes we want that sort of instant gratification that comes with the job well done or, or learning something quickly, but that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes we're lucky enough to move along much faster than others, but we want to be patient. We want to know and acknowledge and maybe even say to ourselves, it's okay. I'm going at this pace. This is kind of how it's going to be for a while or maybe even not for very long, but we just want to constantly acknowledge that nothing's sort of set in stone um, and timelines are all so variable that we can't necessarily compare um, to others. And so just give yourself some time be patient, allow those around you to know that things may take longer, things may take time, but you wanna sort of try and be on the same page with those around you and especially your medical team. So you can be like this guy. All right. All right, frustration. So um, we know full and well that in dealing with cancer, um, it's, it's obviously extremely frustrating. You're not able to do the things you necessarily were able to do before. It's taking up your time, it's taking up your energy, it's definitely costing money. Um, all of these things are of course going to lead to frustration, but those aren't the only things that are leading to that. And so one of the things um, I think is important is how we sort of examine shame. 
um, whether that's how we're feeling about ourselves um, and, and our maybe potential inability to do some of the things we were able to do prior. Um, also how we're sort of maybe not as active within the uh, community socially. Um, we're not necessarily able to engage with others quite as much as we had before. Um, we may even uh, be sort of uh, reclusive as we're trying to learn how to adapt to uh, this new sort of scenario. And so you want to try and sort of move away from guilting yourself too often, whether that's because maybe you used to smoke cigarettes and now um, you're saying maybe I shouldn't have smoked all those cigarettes and now I'm here. Try and remove that from the sort of uh, from your mindset. Just try and move forward, try and stay in the moment. We'll talk about mindfulness in a little bit, but shaming yourself isn't going to uh, do you any favors, unfortunately. Um, as you're doing so, really, you're kind of um, going to cause some processes within your brain that are going to feed into you being uh, having less immunity, um, being more inflamed, all of these sort of things. Uh, your body is going to respond to that stress poorly, and uh, it's not going to be ideal for your prognosis either. And so. We really just want to try and stay as positive as possible. Um, yeah. So I think an a important piece here with the shame is the withdrawal from family and friends. Sometimes there's just shame at the diagnosis. There still can be for many a stigma around a cancer diagnosis. And uh, looking at who do you tell, who are you willing to tell, who are you willing to let your family members tell about the diagnosis. You know, sometimes there's this challenge in couples uh, where the person who has the diagnosis does not want other people to know. And it is more often when I'm working with couples that the, the husband doesn't want people to know. They don't want them in their business. They don't want them to look at them differently. They don't want to think of them as a sick, to be thought of as a sick person, what happens then is some tendency to withdraw from social interactions. And it also limits the ability of your family members if they're not allowed to tell people to get the support that they need. We talk about cancer as a family illness. Everybody is impacted by this diagnosis. And because of that, everybody needs some support around it. And so if you are not telling people about the diagnosis and you're then discouraging your wife from telling people, you're limiting everybody's ability to find that social support. And social support is something else that really does um, impact your ability to cope in a way that decreases isolation, decreases depression, decreases anxiety, and just again, increases reported quality of life. And we also want to talk a little bit about staying motivated um, as you sort of push through. Uh, we certainly know that staying strong, staying healthy, um, all of these things is going to contribute to a good prognosis. But in sort of looking at what motivates us, I uh, certainly want to take some time to examine the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And so with intrinsic motivation, this is often where I feel a sense of pride from inside. I feel as though I want to get better both for me, both for my family and beyond. And so really I have a lot of internal motivators um, for getting me through. Now, external motivation or extrinsic motivation, this may be for certain things I want to achieve or whether that's for recognition from others, maybe it's so that I can go back to work. Um, these motivators can certainly be helpful, but it's often uh, more effective actually to have those intrinsic motivators so that you're sort of telling yourself, you know, supporting yourself and loving yourself and saying, okay, I'm capable of this because I genuinely want to do it. I'm not doing it for someone else's sake. Um, while you can do both, of course, you want to get better for your family, but having that intrinsic mindset as well so that you're being kind to yourself and constantly sort of uh, staying in that state of motivation and knowing that you have that much internal drive. So being able to find uh, those reasons that are unique to you for why you're able to get up in the morning, what's gonna get you out of bed, what's gonna get you started or get you to your appointments, um, really just sort of staying in that sort of positive mindset so that you're able to accomplish that much more. And of course, you are worthy of happiness. Of course. Um, we definitely wanna acknowledge the fact that 
while times do get miserable, you of course have the right to be happy. And when you do have those moments that shine a little brighter, uh, maybe you're feeling a little better on a certain day, you know, take the time to acknowledge it, take the time to really enjoy it so that you do have those sort of memories of, okay, this is why I'm doing this. This is where um, we're making progress. And this is how I can sort of track the uh, progression that's happening. So make sure you notice those moments, make sure you share them with your loved ones and as you move forward. I think, and we'll talk a little bit in a little bit about um, gratitude, mindfulness, being in the moment. I think all of that plays into that. You're worthy of happiness, just really paying attention to the things that give you joy and the things that you're grateful for in your life. Okay, patience. Now, patience, of course, is a challenging virtue indeed. Um, I believe that the Dalai Lama once said that it is uh, quite the foreign entity um, if we are to find it, but the benefits are grand if we can endure. And so as we're sort of looking for patience in those moments where we're either sitting in a weight room or we're sitting uh, get, receiving chemo or just waiting for a prognosis to sort of improve or any situation, patience is always going to be sort of at the back of that and just really the lens that we're, we can look through um, in moving forward. And so in doing so, uh, you always want to be sort of persistent. Patience isn't going to come naturally. You're going to have to sort of remind yourself to be actively engaged with uh, pursuing it. And so uh, in any moment where you're finding, okay, I'm fed up, I'm sick, I'm tired, um, you know, of course you want to sort of give yourself that moment, feel uh, what you're feeling. You don't want to discourage yourself from that or, or try to hide from it, but you also want to sort of try and cycle right back to being patient, knowing that you can be patient, that you're capable of it, and uh, just being persistent with that. Um, and so this sort of comes to the point of mindfulness. So Mindfulness is really sort of defined as uh, being within the moment, right? We want to sort of be present. Um, we can kind of acknowledge the fact that a lot of anxiety is held within the future and a lot of our depression and pain is held from the past or past experiences. And so if we're able to sort of stay in the present moment and sort of enjoy what we can um, and what we're capable of enjoying in that moment, uh, we'll have that much more calm uh, and we'll be able to recognize it in future moments, um, sort of how I mentioned uh, in the last slide. And uh, ways that mindfulness can be practiced, um, sometimes it's as simple as uh, deep breathing. I personally like a 444 method. That means inhaling for four seconds, holding for four seconds, and then exhaling, inhaling through the nostrils, and then exhaling out of the mouth. Um, this is a technique I heard was founded by Navy SEALs who were in the field. So uh, certainly is used under pressure in high stakes situations. Um, so feel free to use that. Um, other ways, we really wanna sort of engage as many senses as possible in doing so. So sometimes a practice as simple as mindful eating. So let's say you're eating a grape or something and before you eat it, you wanna sort of watch it, observe it, um, view it, sort of examining all the sort of divots and grooves and colors and everything that you may not have taken the time to look at before, then you're going to sort of put it in your mouth and feel how it feels, whether with your tongue or your teeth, then you're going to finally uh, breathe in and uh, take a bite. And doing this so slowly and so mindfully is going to give you a little bit more appreciation for the grape itself and for that moment that you've just sort of spent um, sort of catering to yourself. Um, I don't know if you want to yep, I'm going to add a little bit, sure. given the picture that we have here, a place that I think is really beneficial to be mindful is in nature. There's so much research lately about the benefits of nature. So through the Cancer Wellness Center, we do hikes. We just put in a labyrinth um, outside at the Cancer Wellness Center for a mindful walking meditation. So when Dom was talking earlier about incorporating all the senses, I think it's really easiest to do that when we're outside in nature because taking a deep breath gives us a smell of the earth or the trees or flowers whatever fresh air we might be in um, there's so much to see near us and in the distance and green is just a very calming color so all of the earth tones um, everything that we see around us and when we're walking slowly doing a mindful mindfulness walking um, 
or hiking, we can really pay attention to the movements of our body, the footsteps and the feel of the earth under our feet and just play around with uh, different textures that we walk in on, things that we feel. So one thing I like about mindfulness too and being in nature is kind of a playfulness, like really enjoying being in the moment, um, having fun with it, not a lot of pressure around it. Another key component of mindfulness is non-judgment. So whatever we're doing, we're trying it out. We're just seeing what it's like in the moment and not judging ourselves. We can be really hard, hard on ourselves for not doing it right or my mind is wandering and it's what our mind does, particularly when we're under stress. And so just catching it, bringing it back and um, practicing being in the moment. Yeah, and so I think a lot of that ties right into flexibility, you know, and really just this ability to sort of say, Okay, um, as I shift from moment to moment, um, whether that moment is good or whether that's a challenging moment, um, how am I sort of adapting? You know, I don't think you can even really talk about flexibility without mentioning adaptability. And so being able to sort of uh, change your mindset um, as you're sort of moving through different scenarios, whether that means, uh, you know, spending time with your family to uh, maybe even being at the doctor's office when you are stressed, sort of just allowing yourself to move into that moment, um, being mindful while you're in it, um, sort of just practicing and taking care to just sort of note everything that's kind of going on without lurching to, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Just sort of saying, okay, I'm here right now. Let me just try and rein myself in. Um, and yeah, I, I completely agree as far as getting out in nature and sometimes using past experiences from when you were in nature um, to sort of think about uh, using visualization to sort of take yourself out of a stressful, stressful scenario and thinking about, okay, I was in a field a couple of weeks ago and my toes were curled into the grass. What did that grass feel like? Was it cold? Was it wet? Um, what was the air like? Sort of trying to remember and also engage as many of those senses as possible um, while sort of sitting in that memory can be so helpful. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. And then do you want to describe the trade-offs? Um, you know, I mentioned the one before that uh, in the prostate cancer research, they talked about trade-offs with sexual functioning for health, for prolonged life. But I think so many trade-offs that people have when there's a cancer diagnosis, um, maybe not being able to work anymore, um, but are there still good things that you can find from that? You know, are there hobbies that you can pick up? So I don't think we need to go into a lot of depth around it, but just looking at, are there trade-offs that you make consciously that are choices you make, things that are losses and acknowledging their, lo their losses, but some benefit that you get in, in place of what it is you've lost. Certainly, and you know, as you sort of examine, uh, what, time, what you have time for as far as activities. Maybe uh, you're not quite as mobile as you used to be. So how do you want to sort of trade off for um, what you're passionate about? Maybe this is an opportunity to sort of dive into uh, more academic things like reading or watching documentaries, learning. Um, and, you know, while it might not be the number one thing that you wanted to do, just being able to sort of have the mindset of allowing yourself to get excited about something else, about a new pursuit, about learning um, and expanding, that really ties right back into flexibility and just being able to sort of say, you know, just because this one door is closed does not mean that all doors have and that there will be new opportunities that sort of open up to me as I move forward. Um, and of course that can lead to your ability to then recognize growth. Because of course, if we shut our minds off to the, to the fact that we still have this ability to grow and to move forward as we progress, um, we're gonna kind of like stagnate and uh, that's not necessarily going to be either good for our family or either good for our, uh, our diagnosis or really so many um, different avenues within our lives. So we always wanna sort of sit back and sort of say, okay, I was here uh, a week ago, how am I today? What's sort of going on? What capacities am I growing in? Whether that's mentally, whether that's physically, there are just so many different avenues for that growth. Um, the relaxation techniques, I don't think in the interest of time, I'm just gonna mention really quickly, there are lots of 
ways that you can practice different relaxation techniques. Dom already mentioned deep breathing. There are many different types of deep breathing exercises. There is um, the, certainly some meditative movement uh, like yoga, Tai Chi, walking meditation, hiking. Um, there are sitting meditations, guided imagery, relaxation exercises. We've got a class here every Tuesday that you can right now do virtually on Tuesday afternoons, a stress reduction class where the facilitator, Michelle, um, helps you, walks you through a practice, a different practice each week. There are all kinds of apps now that you can find, Calm, Headspace, many if you just do searches. So lots of ways to practice different relaxation techniques. Yeah, and then um, also as you're sort of going through, whether you're using those uh, relaxation techniques or finding new ways to uh, practice mindfulness and learn patience, um, you also want to sort of see how you're um, engaging with uh, different activities, right? And so this technique of graduated exposure or systematic, systematic desensitization is often something used with phobias. And so in conquering fears or in conquering challenges, you're sort of taking your time in uh, moving forward with learning something. So let's say I'm having challenges with walking. Um, I'm sort of going to take my time in relearning. Okay, I'm doing the physical therapy. That's going um, at its own pace. As I'm doing this, maybe I want to try and bring it outside. Maybe I'm slowly moving and working up to something. And so being able to sort of have that focal point and being able to recognize, okay, what is it that my goal is and how can I sort of get there in this sort of um, very intentional and yet uh, slow way um, can be super helpful as far as being able to accomplish what it is that you set your sights on. And in doing so, we of course want to be patient. All right. All right, I'm going to jump into the fixer problem solver. Um, men just by nature tend to be fixers. They like to solve problems and cancer is a good way to, um, to is a good, pro not a good problem manage. It is a problem <laughs> that definitely could use some fixing and solving. And so when we're talking about redefining masculinity, it's all of those traits of masculinity that Dom talked about earlier in the presentation, that now with a cancer diagnosis, you can reassert, reaffirm, redefine, and find ways to put them to good use. So as we mentioned before, men tend to be more reluctant to seek health care. And then with a cancer diagnosis, there are so many doctor's appointments. So the way to really put that fixing and problem solving to use, and really that sense of control, is to be an active part of your healthcare team to talk with, ideally bring somebody with you to appointments. I know that's a little bit trickier right now, but that's starting to open up a bit more. So when we are meeting with a doctor, it can be really hard to take everything in, having somebody else there with you, whether a spouse, an adult child, a friend, to help take notes, but even talk to that person before you go in, what kind of, what kind of questions do you want to ask? Have those questions written down. Um, they, you know, feeling like you really do um, take a more active role in your treatment when you're honest with your doctor about the challenges that you're having, any GI issues, fatigue, pain, whatever it might be, they are best able to help you. You're best able to help yourself and advocate for yourself when you are an active member of the healthcare team. So I think that's a great way to redefine masculinity around the fixing, problem solving, and somewhat that sense of control. Yeah, and we also want to make sure that, you know, whatever sort of defense mechanisms are necessary for you to alter perceptions to give you that much more strength and courage as you go through your diagnosis, whether that's humor, whether that's altering your attitude, um, whatever that may be, um, make sure it sort of ties into your personality. If you're uh, someone who likes to make jokes a lot, um, maybe that's the way you can sort of move through this as you joke around with your family members. Um, maybe it's not something you want to joke around with and you want to take it entirely seriously and deal with it as the sort of problem solver and make it so that, you know, this is your task, this is your goal, and uh, you're going to be very regimented about it, but sort of taking on a uh, persona um, that, that fits um, what's best for you uh, as you move through this can be really helpful as some of the 
qualities that maybe you were using prior to the diagnosis may not be quite as effective. And so just sort of check in with what's best for me and what's going to sort of give me the strength uh, to do what's, what's necessary as I move through and what's also going to let me be sort of available and, um, and open as I communicate with my family and, and the ones I, I care about. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and that, so that you mentioned the humor, if you're kind of a yeah. guy who likes a sense of humor, we find often with a cancer diagnosis, there's this dark sense of humor or gallows humor, but that can be really helpful. It can also give us kind of a sense of control to, to joke a little bit about the challenges that we face. So if that's what you're doing, it might be a little bit off-putting to some people, but others will completely be able to relate. If you're in a men's group, probably that's some of the humor that you that you have going on there. That sense of control, um, you know, I mentioned with as a member of an active member of the healthcare team, but when Dom was talking before about some of the self-care practices and wellness, taking more control over your health, exercise, what you eat, all of that can help with that sense of control. Um, some men like to make sure that if they're concerned about their mortality, which of course, tends to be a reality that being faced with your mortality when there's a cancer diagnosis, they might like to make sure that financial affairs are in order so that if they don't survive their diagnosis, that their family is taken care of. They might like to make funeral arrangements, even if their prognosis is good, just having some of those things taken care of can also give them a sense of control. We talked before about having small attainable goals that can help with a sense of control. We talked a little bit about a focus on gratitude. So really paying attention to what are the things in your life that you still really enjoy, the people you enjoy, the activities, the places, just being grateful for what is still going well in your life can also attribute to that sense of control and attitude, which is another bullet point there. Yes, indeed. And so speaking of attitude, um... Some of you may have heard about, uh, you know, this concept of archetypes and really these uh, identities that have sort of been crystallized in the human experience uh, through time, whether that's uh, basically in the uh, collective unconscious, basically this space that of experiences that we all sort of know about, but haven't necessarily had, but maybe have had some contact with uh, either tangentially or in our own sort of primary experience. Um, and so some of those include the earth mother, the magician, the wise old man, the artist, um, all these sort of things. I'm sure you can think of someone right off the top of your head, whether it's a person you've met or someone you've seen in a movie or a book or what have you. And so one of these archetypes is the king. And so uh, this is a, a, a capacity that we can all sort of fulfill as men or women. And um, it's basically these specific traits, um, wisdom, being graceful and grateful, uh, being patient, stoic, self-aware, also being a mentor, which we'll get into uh, later, and then also being surrounded by allies. And so really, as we're trying to uh, get through the diagnosis, being able to sort of relate to this identity of what it's like to be this sort of king-like character and allowing ourselves to feel a little bit regal and giving ourselves the confidence of a king can be so helpful as we sort of try to find out um, what sort of masculinity we want to hold on to. And of course, while avoiding, you know, in this, in being this kind of king, we're kind of avoiding some of these more negative uh, traits that would sort of be more dismissive or cruel. And uh, we just want to be a really sort of like kind and gracious individual while showing uh, gratitude to those around us and uh, also just being that kind of a leader, if possible. I like that surrounded by my allies. Um, that is that social support. <laughs> Keep your friends close. Join a support group. Those are your allies. Those are your allies. <laughs> those are your uh, brothers in arms. Yes. Okay. And so um, go through this one. All right. Some haste. Yes. Um, so do you want to do this one? I or? can start. Sure. Yeah? So building okay. resilience. Let me just give you a definition quickly of what resilience is. An individual's ability to maintain or restore relatively stable psychological and physical functioning when you're confronted by a stressful life event, which obviously cancer is, or confronted by adversity. And then post-traumatic growth, one of the pieces that we'll get to here, is positive life changes that are a result of a major crisis. 
what research has found is that people don't just automatically have post-traumatic growth though, it's, it's when they search for it with the meaning making or trying to make sense of the experience that they're having. So even though there's lots of distress with a cancer diagnosis, there can be remarkable resilience. Um, you want to add anything to that? Before we yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, as you're sort of examining like what personality traits you already do have, um, whether that's sort of like your openness or your, uh, your extroversion, like any, any of these sort of traits that you already possess, you want to try and strengthen them and use them uh, to your benefit. If you are more introverted, maybe now's the time to sort of start researching because you like to research, you're more academic. Or if you're extroverted, maybe you're trying to join that support group because you need to talk things through. So you just want to sort of try to accentuate what um, traits you already do possess so that things are kind of natural for you. Um, and then, of course, you do want to build social support because, of course, we are stronger together than alone. Um, we uh, And then building resilience in particular will have that much more strength if we have others to rely on and to relate to, um, whether that's with family or support groups or even just your uh, medical team. You definitely don't want to go through this entirely by yourself. Um, and you, of course, want to be optimistic or, you know, distract yourself with a good book every now and then or a nice hike or whatever. But do things to sort of uh, engage in that self-care so that you're that much stronger when the challenges do arise. And the, that distraction I, I find interesting because sometimes, so meaning making is when people work to make sense or make some meaning about why was I diagnosed or just the general meaning of life. Not everybody's able to do that. So research is interesting that sometimes what helps for people is accepting this has no meaning. This was random. And that again speaks to what Don was saying that we all have different traits that we bring into this. And so we're all going to find this resilience a little bit differently. Sometimes people have certain traits that help make resilience a little bit easier. And sometimes it's things that we have to work at. But social support in all of the research um, is one of the things that they say most people who find some social support, whether again, that's friends or support groups or family, tend to um, have more sense of resilience. They think that might be because they have people with whom they can be vulnerable, where they can do some exploration, where they can make some meaning, where they can find things to be grateful for. That hope and op optimism um, is an interesting one because optimism is a, personal a personality trait. Hope though is something that initially with a cancer diagnosis, what people are hoping for is a cure. And that isn't always going to be the case. So maybe we hope for a cure and there comes a point where we're told that is no longer likely. And what do we find to be hopeful for at that point? So even when people are in hospice, they find things to be hopeful for. That might be continued connection with family. That might be um, a comfortable death. That might be not experiencing pain. That might be... Um, reacquainting with or uh, having some forgiveness and reacquaintance with family members where there have been some struggles. There can be all kinds of things to hope for, but sometimes there has to be a little bit of work at that. Uh, there was some interesting research a number of years ago in palliative care. So just real quickly, if you don't know the difference, palliative care is a part of hospice. Sometimes people still think that that is hospice, but palliative care is something that you can access at any point once you're diagnosed with cancer. And palliative care is simply palliating symptoms. It's symptom management, it's focusing on quality of life. And this research on palliative care was researching people with a lung cancer diagnosis. And they found that the earlier that they accessed palliative care while they were still in curative treatment, they tended to report better quality of life and lived statistically longer than those people who did not access palliative care but also their family members, particularly those involved in their immediate care, also reported better quality of life. Because when people physically feel better, they emotionally feel better, it's easier to be optimistic. It's easier to find things to be hopeful for or hopeful about. So all of those are aspects of building resilience. And then that post-traumatic growth piece is really about after facing this adversity, and trying to make sense of it, trying to find some meaning. Um, is there some growth 
that comes from this experience. Sometimes that happens during a diagnosis. Sometimes for people lucky enough to have post-treatment health, no evidence of disease, it comes with time after the diagnosis. So sometimes there are people who even during their treatment are able to say, you know, there's, um, I've got this new sense of priority. I've got this newfound gratitude. And I wouldn't have had that without my cancer diagnosis. But a lot of people cringe at that, particularly when they're still in treatment, it can be hard to access that. And it might be when you're further away from treatment and feeling healthier, that it's easier to look back on that and see what good might have come out of a bad situation. So it's really post-traumatic growth can be about finding good or gratitude in the face of adversity. If you want to switch to that next mm -hmm. slide. So just really quickly, um, there was some research that was published just in 2019 where they were looking at these different pathways to, uh, to resilience. And the direct pathway, which is the orange there, is people, as we were talking about, have certain coping abilities or certain personality traits that make it a little bit easier to get to that resilience. So that might be the hope and the optimism um, that um, help us to feel more resilient. The sense of coherence, I just wanna explain that really quickly. That is a term that was coined in the late 70s and there are three aspects to sense of coherence that I think are just interesting to think about how you might define these for yourself. So the first is comprehensibility and that is a cognitive aspect. So it's something that we do um, in our thought processes and it refers to the extent to which we might perceive that, we, that both internal and external stimuli, um, it, it, they impact our experience. So this might also have to do with having the ability to see things in your life as orderly and clear and coherent and structured. So it has some sense of control. You can comprehend or make sense of what's happening in your life. There's manageability as part of that sense of coherence. So that is a behavioral aspect and feeling like you have the resources to be able to manage what you're facing. Do you have the resources to be able to manage this diagnosis? That might mean resources in the form of your medical team. That might mean resources um, in the form of support from family and friends, but you have the ability to cope and solve problems. That's that part of sense of coherence. And the other one is meaningfulness. So that's a motivational aspect. And it has to do with the extent, extent that you feel that your life has some kind of emotional meaning. So having those um, things in the orange box as part of your personality traits or your, part of your coping, uh, they've found is what we may call a direct pathway to resilience. And the other more indirect pathways that are mentioned there, redefining yourself. So that would be like redefining and having some flexibility about how you define max masculinity once you're diagnosed with cancer. Um, your, in, your ability to find some benefit or again, make some meaning or make some sense of your experience. So those are things that certainly you can work on um, with actively searching, in, struggling with that, exploring it in counseling, discussing it with your spouse, um, discussing it in your support group. So many different ways to resilience. And then next we're gonna talk a little bit about support. Anything you wanna to add to that? Uh, I think just for time. Just for time, so, keep on moving. So. Oh, PTG, I should say there is post-traumatic growth. So those talk about some on the right-hand side, some of the aspects or benefits of post-traumatic growth for people who get to that place. Okay. Um, so support, as we sort of mentioned earlier, um, I think it's always necessary, especially as we sort of tie back into that definition of masculinity. A lot of that comes with this idea of that, um, you know, men don't necessarily uh, need the support of others uh, and that they are capable and that much more manly if they're able to do it on their own sort of idea of the self-made man is its own sort of archetype, especially here in America um, where we celebrate individualism. And so in doing so, and as we sort of examine support and look at like how we need to uh, sometimes reach out to others and examine, okay, what kind of help do I need exactly? If I have young children, 
do I need someone to uh, care for my kids or help me as I'm, you know, preparing to talk to them? Do I need uh, to sort of examine what I, how I'm sort of dealing with my uh, diagnosis? Um, is it causing me to have issues uh, within my family with, at work uh, in various uh, aspects of my life? And then how are we able to sort of improve these things by seeking out that support? And so when we do so, that may be through just like talking to a friend that might be through counseling, which we offer here, of course, we have support groups, one-on-one, -on -one, um, couples counseling, family counseling, um, all of these sort of things available for free. And um, also just sort of making sure, are you sort of being your best self, right? Um, and if not, how is that sort of affecting you and those around you? And so we also need to talk about this idea of interdependence. And so what this is, is essentially uh, sometimes we do need to depend on others. And so examining um, what level of inter interdependence or what level is necessary for us to sort of relate to others and then be able to rely on others um, because we may not be quite as capable of doing everything by ourselves um, and just sort of allowing ourselves uh, both the patients and understanding that, you know, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to, to need a little bit more time or to need really anything from anyone else. Hopefully we have those people in our lives who can support us um, when we are down or when we are needing um, assistance. And so really, as we even think about the greater concept of mutual dependence, and we even look at our society, you know, we wouldn't be able to use our computers or use the roads or really even eat or anything if we weren't able to rely on each other, right? We have all of these sort of different um, institutions that all run based on us working together. And so if we put this from the uh, sort of macro scale down to the micro scale and realize that ultimately things work from person to person and that we, if we are able to rely on each other, we'll have that much more of a productive society and then we'll be that much more healthy and whole because we won't have to expend all of this energy just trying to provide for ourselves, then I think we can all agree that we'll, we'll be doing a little bit better. Um, so be sure to seek out that support um, as you need it. I would just wanna give a plug for the specific support groups that we have. So as we mentioned before, Dom facilitates a support group for men with a cancer diagnosis, men of all ages, but also a young adult group that's co-ed, which is uh, men and women 20 to 40 with a cancer diagnosis. And we've got another co-ed support group, again, any age, but tends to be older adults who have a uh, cancer diagnosis. We do also have significant other groups, a couple of those that are co-ed for spouses of somebody with a diagnosis. Mentorship, okay. So uh, the reason that we have this here is that initial research that I mentioned uh, where they talked about self-image uh, self and um, masculinity, a, a piece that kept coming up was mentorship, that they found that men who found the opportunities to mentor other men who had a cancer diagnosis was one really important way to reassert or redefine masculinity, because when you're being a mentor, you're having to talk about your own experience. So you no longer have that stoicism, but instead the vulnerability of talking to other people. And yet that can still be a masculine trait. You have this sense of power and leadership and strength as a mentor, and that might be in a support group, that might be in an advocacy organization, that might be in talking to friends and family about the importance of getting a colonoscopy or seeking health care or prostate exams or anything that relates to your cancer that you are sharing um, and mentoring others around cancer specific organizations. Um, us too is a prostate cancer organization. There are cancer specific organizations for every cancer. Um, Immerman Angels, uh, one thing we didn't mention that also came up often is this attitude of a, men often like a fighting or a battle kind of attitude and mentality. And I know in Immerman's Angels, which is a mentorship organization, that's some of the language that you use that, or that they use, that the cancer fighters are those with a cancer diagnosis and the angels are the mentors. So if you are looking for a mentorship opportunity, you can contact, contact I'm sorry, tongue titles on Immerman's Angels 
and um, apply to be a mentor. So they would sign you up, hook you up with other people who've had your diagnosis and you're a little further along and would be a mentor for them to kind of help them and support them through their early diagnosis and treatment. Yeah, and I think it all really feeds into this idea that we can sort of all heal through acts of altruism and just by feeding into others, we feed into ourselves. And so um, anytime, you know, you're feeling low, if you are to reach out and help someone else or to guide them or to at least give them a little bit of strength at a time when you know they need it because you know you needed it maybe uh, during that time, you're going to feel better. You're going to feel good about yourself. Um, and then you're going to maybe even talk to someone about it and want to keep that sort of uh, chain going, you know, positivity, pay it forward, um, all these sort of notions. And then um, just sort of uh, promoting gratitude and promoting positivity, um, which I think is really at the core of this mm -hmm. entire thing. Um, so just being sure to do that and just knowing that allowing yourself to be in that sort of role um, is going to be fulfilling, especially if you feel as though you're powerless. There's always something um, that you can do and it'll make you feel good. So uh, certainly something to consider. And uh, yeah, we have some other programs uh, coming up. That's the last of our slides for the presentation itself. Um, but uh, as we continue along with this men's symposium series. Uh, we have a hike coming up June 24th, so that's in two weeks, and uh, we'll be going for a lovely little walk in the woods. Uh, please come out and join us. I know I've told my members in the uh, men's group, I'm looking forward to seeing some of you there. Um, that'll be at one o'clock. And then uh, improving intimacy and sexual health after cancer, so that's one we certainly talked about. So We'll be having a uh, physician come in and uh, discussing that and different ways that you can recreate intimacy or find new routes to um, being aroused or uh, reintroducing um, intercourse into your life. Um, and then that's in July. And then prostate cancer protection on your plate. So that's going to be more nutritional. Um, and so these are just ways that you can sort of take care of yourself, take care of your gut and uh, ensure that you're as healthy as possible on the nutritional side. Um, and in the future, we don't have dates for these, but they're coming. We've got advances in prostate cancer treatment, um, pelvic floor rehabilitation for men. So that's some exercises for ensuring you have strength within your pelvic floor, um, cancer pain and fatigue. So how to get back to living your life. So that's really just gonna give you some information as far as um, what you can do to regain some of that energy. Um, we'll have the men's wellness retreat. Um, we'll have an exercise class. So we'll have a private, a personal trainer come in to do some exercises so you can uh, get a little bit of physical therapy on us. And yoga for stress relief. We always provide yoga here. And uh, this one will be particularly for men. So um, you can look forward to that if that fits your fancy. So um, these are our references. And now I believe we have some time for questions. Can stop sharing. Actually, we're going to make sure they see our Estellas. Oh, yeah. Thank you to Estellas for underwriting this program and our men's health programs in 20. 21 and probably into 2022. Oh, certainly. All right. Excellent. So, all right. Thank now. you.